Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord God, make us worthy to enter your house with diligence, to knock at your door with confidence, and to worship you in your sanctuary with sincerity. Answer us with kindness and respond to our petitions from the treasury of your mercy. Then we shall glorify you with joy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your merciful love, according to your great compassion, Blot out my transgressions. Yes, you delight in sincerity of heart. In secret you teach me wisdom. Cleanse me with his soap and I shall be pure. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Restore in me the joy of your salvation. Sustain in me a willingly spirit. I will teach transgressors your ways, that sinners may return to you. For in sacrifice you take no delight. Burnt offering for me would not please you. I sacrifice to God a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart. Your God, you will not spurn. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. To the praise, glory, and honor of the most holy Trinity, to the Thomas Incense. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the chalice of salvation which was filled on Golgotha. Sinners drank from it and they were pardoned. With the blood of forgiveness they poured forth from the cross. All people were marked and escaped death. As this chalice united to his holy body shall be blessed and consecrated for the pardon of faults and for the forgiveness of sins for his flock. We raise glory and honor to the good one on this day and all the days of our lives and forever. O Christ our God, in your great and unspeakable love for all people, 
you became our sacrifice on Golgotha. By offering yourself, you pardon the sin of the world. You enabled weak and sinful people to receive your body and life-giving blood. You have made us worthy of offering you acceptable sacrifices in memory of your saving passion and glorious resurrection. You have given us this sign for the purification of our souls and bodies. With the prophet David we cry out and we say, I shall receive the chalice of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. O merciful Lord, we now implore your goodness to consecrate this chalice, mixed with wine and water through the holiness of its union to your sacred body. May it become a chalice of thanksgiving and salvation for all those who drink from it and are purified. May it become a chalice which is a pledge of new life for us. May it become a chalice which unites us to the guest of your banquet. May it become a chalice which opens to us the gates of your heavenly kingdom. May it forgive our faults and pardon our sins. Through it may we share with the faithful departed in the joy which will never end. We raise our voices to thank you, O Christ, and through and with you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Sanctify our minds and purify our conscience. 
washing sins, that we may pray you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever. So strengthen your drooping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet, that what is lame may not be dislocated, but healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one be deprived of the grace of God that no bitter roots spring up and cause trouble, through which many may become defiled, that no one be an immoral or profane person like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit his father's blessing, he was rejected because he found no opportunity to change his mind even though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not approached that which could be touched in a blazing fire, in gloomy darkness, in storm, in a trumpet blast, in a voice speaking words, such that those who heard begged that no message be further addressed to them, for they could not bear to hear the command If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so fearful was the spectacle that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. Since it was the day of preparation, The Jews did not wish the bodies left upon the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first and of the other, who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. And he who saw this has testified so that you also may believe his testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, says, they shall look upon the one whom they have pierced. (laughs) 
Be at peace with everyone and pursue the holiness without which no one can see God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is chapter 12 from the letter to the Hebrews. And the lesson that is essential to it is this fact of how do we deal with the situation in our lives? They are rarely ecstatically happy. And even when they are, it doesn't last. So St. Paul in this chapter 12 begins famously by reminding the Hebrews. Remember again, it is considered that these are Jewish converts and not only are the Hebrews Jewish converts, but many of them to whom this letter is being written are priests of the temple who have converted to receive the Messiah. And so St. Paul has gone through examples of Old Testament saints in the previous chapters, which is why this chapter 12 begins by saying, so we have a great cloud of witnesses in front of us. We are surrounded by those who have gone before us. So hold firm. And then he goes into the section of talking where he speaks about be at peace with everyone. But this text follows a section in which he starts talking about discipline. So first, we have the cloud of witnesses. We have the examples before us. Their lives were not easy. Isaiah was cut in half and killed by the Jews. And it said cut in half and actually with a wooden saw. So I don't know how you actually tear someone apart like that, but that is what the rabbis speak of, of Isaiah's death. Jeremiah was captured and taken off and ultimately killed also. So the prophets have come, and in this action, St. Paul says, they too suffered. And he's not saying that what they're going through, because of course the context of this letter is that they are being persecuted by their fellow Jews who have not accepted the Messiah. And so the section in, in this chapter 12, just before, speaking about being at peace, he uses all of the examples of discipline. He says, our fathers in the flesh who gave us life, we accepted the discipline they brought us up with because the father, he says, they did the be as best as they could see fit, they disciplined us. And for that, we are grateful. We look back on what they gave us because he says it is only a father who loves who actually disciplines. A father who does not love does not discipline. He lets you do whatever and you just kind of grow into an animal. And as we know, it, it, that's just us culturally these days. Paternity has died away in many cases over the last decades. But St. Paul says in a normal situation, of course, and in St. Paul's time, fathers understood this grave responsibility that you are bringing up the next generation. And so that discipline, which sometimes, of course, is going to be too harsh, not because the fathers always intend to be harsh, but it just comes out that way, shortness of temper, bad patience, bad day. And yet we look at it and know that it is still the correction that has given us discipline in our generation. It's almost impossible to preach the gospel to someone who's still 36 and living in their mother's basement. Because if they're so undisciplined they can't even live on their own as an adult, what are they possibly going to understand about the transcendent discipline that is given by God? And he says, for that reason, if you are being disciplined now, and persecution is crashing down around your heads, he says you should understand that it's actually a sign of the love of God. Because God is training you. God is disciplining you. God is teaching you. And if he didn't love you, well then he doesn't care if you're disciplined or not. He doesn't care if you have a sense of order or some kind of sense of foresight or prudence or anything else that's involved. It echoes the book of Maccabees. In the book of Maccabees, you have this huge persecution and destruction that takes place of the people of Israel. And there's a point in the book of the Maccabees, book one or book two, I don't recall now. But the author makes an aside and he says, please don't read this incorrectly, what I'm writing you. 
Please don't think that they're being punished because they are disliked. The contrary. God does this to us because he loves us and he immediately corrects us so that we do not become worse. It is a beautiful aside in the book of Maccabees as a reminder. Because in human nature, I, you, the, all of us, our tendency and default mechanism is just to complain. That's, you know, we don't like the way things go. That's much of our lives. And so St. Paul is putting in a condition as saying, see providence. Remember the idea of nepsis and then the idea of working towards things being transparent, to see the hand of God behind them. That's what St. Paul is saying here. Yes, you're being persecuted. Yes, some of you have lost your homes even, lost your revenue, lost your income. He says, but you're also, if you're listening to this letter, you've not been killed yet. So it's not yet been to blood. And it's at that point when he speaks on these conditions, the examples we have before us in the Old Testament, and the discipline that God is teaching us goodness in this time of difficulty, he then says in this condition, so, strengthen your knees. He's actually quoting from the prophets. So strengthen your knees, bring up your arms, the feebleness of your hands, and move forward. And that's the context that he then says, be at peace with everyone, insofar as you are able. It is the lesson of our Lord in the gospel. It is a lesson of our Lord on Good Friday, that no one goes through life without enemies, not even God himself. So when we leave, live our lives, it's not that we try to please everyone, because it's ridiculous anyways, you're still not going to please all of them. And that's not what St. Paul says here. What he says is, be at peace with everyone insofar as you are able. In other words, when I finish this day and I retire to sleep, what St. Paul is saying is I should be able to say with clarity of conscience that anyone who is in opposition to me is such not through my fault. There will always be people in opposition to us. All we can do is to be like Jesus on Calvary. You kill me unjustly, I have done nothing to you. And if I have done something to these people, I need to be honest with myself in my heart of hearts, and I need to make reparation for that. That is what St. Paul says in another epistle where he says, do not let the sun go down upon your anger. So that is the meaning when he says here, be at peace with everyone, insofar as you are able, pursuing that holiness without which no one can see God. Holiness is a consecration of transcendence. Holiness is the notion of inviolability. And therefore, holiness is the notion of stability. The holiness of grace that is meant to transform us within ourselves should be that anchor representing hope in our lives. So that when the buffeting of the displeasures of this life and this valley of tears smash into us, we can stand firm, not because we're stoic, not because we're tough, not because we're gritting our teeth, but because we are being transformed interiorly by the inviolability of that holiness which comes from God. Remember, I've told you before that for the fathers of the church, specifically St. Augustine, that grace is a transformation that brings us into the immutability of God, the unchangingness of God, the eternal present of God. And the more that grace transforms our lives, the more that immutability and strength and stability and hence peace becomes ours. This is a vision of the spiritual life which escapes many. But it is actually the very essence of what we do in the spiritual life. It's not the question of nice, warm, tingly feelings. It's the question of stability. 
It is not the pursuit of some kind of airy-fairy fantasies in my imagination. It is a question of the transformation within the immutability of God by his grace. This is that one little phrase what St. Paul means when he says, be at peace with everyone pursuing holiness. Because that peace can never be present without that presence of grace within our lives. So it is a profound lesson. And it's chosen today to link this chapter 12 precisely by the fact of the example that our Lord gives on Good Friday. He says almost nothing during the entire time of his trial and, of course, his carrying of the cross. But he does beautifully, we have in the Gospels, recording those last words of our Lord. And the very first of them being, Father, forgive them, for they have no idea what they're doing. If we could approach all of those, what we think to be idiots and son of a guns in our lives, with the example of Jesus, the clueless Lord. I know she doesn't have the faith. She doesn't see. She lives in darkness. That's not judgmental. That's just simply recognizing the objective truth. And as a child of God, it allows me to have so much more compassion on them. Because I know what we're supposed to be doing here because I have the beauty of the illumination of the faith and the teaching of the catechesis that has been given to me. And because of that fact, I can have compassion on those who do not see, who are just simply befuddled in their own little emotional world and tied up in their passions and lust. That's compassion. Not excusing, it doesn't excuse it, it's a recognition. But it can make me echo the voice of our Lord, saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And that whole aspect is also then echoed by St. Stephen in the very first martyr who sets that standard for us in his death. Because he says essentially, almost word for word, the same thing. Do not lay this sin up to them. As they are pummeling him and be beating him to death by throwing stones. That is the notion behind be at peace with everyone insofar as you are able, pursuing holiness. So may this God of peace, may the Sacred Heart bring to us this transformation within the light of holiness. And may we be brought through his divine blood and his divine body that we celebrate this day of the signing of the chalice into that unchanging, immutable stability of peace. And then, Lord, let your discipline start. Teach me, train me up, and make me holy. And I will suffer whatever comes my way. What a prayer. <laughs> as long as I can be brought to the vision of eternal light. May this be the prayer of Good Friday, to bring us into this peace and into this love and this immutability, immutability so that our lives, from sunup to sundown and through each night till the day we die, radiate peace, be rooted in peace, and be beacons of peace to those around us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Itel wot mandem heida loho, wal wot aloho dam hade tayu, weinem sugo tayu tau, keul al baitoch vesku de haye tu, ot kode
Behold the holy chalice, God's life-giving blood, which is consecrated for all mortals by the apostles. Behold the chalice of salvation, God's living blood. Come forward, all peoples, and rejoice, for it absolves those who partake of it. Behold the chalice which satisfies the thirst of the children of God. Those who drink from it are delivered from the flames of Gehenna. Behold the chalice which was prefigured by the chosen nation. But when Jesus came in person, other nations welcomed him with joy. The honorable priest Aaron prefigured this chalice when he sprinkled the blood of the animals to signify the blood of the Lord. The prophet Moses prefigured this chalice by the Lamb's blood which he sprinkled in Egypt to deliver the children of Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, you by your grace make us worthy to clothe ourselves with the robe of righteousness, that we may serve your mysteries at the table of your heavenly kingdom with pure thoughts. May our consciences be clothed with holiness. May we shine with beauty, and may our souls be crowned with faith, hope, and love. O Lord, may our prayer be acceptable to you. In your compassion, may you gain entry to your treasury of goodness. Obtain the abundance of your riches, the forgiveness of our sins, and the peace and security of your entire flock. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. You are was the solid rock from which flows the twelve rivers for the twelve tribes of Israel. May the love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. 
Make us worthy to praise and adore, Almighty Father, your glorious Son and your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. May the peace of God, the Almighty Father, the security of the Son who governs all, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, who sanctifies and pardons all, be with us and among us all the days of our lives, with this altar and our offering, and with your church and her children, now and forever. Amen. Let us stand devoutly to praise and thank our Savior. The sun clothed itself with mourning, and rocks melted away when they witnessed the Lord of creation hanging upon the cross. We present this offering, this commemoration, and this prayer to the everlasting God, the Ancient of Days. For the living and the dead, for those who are far and those who are near, for churches, monasteries, and convents in every district and region, and for us, who are weak and sinful? Though we are unworthy, you have made us worthy to stand before you and to be remembered in your heavenly kingdom. We pray for those whom we remember today and for those here with us in faith awaiting your abundant mercy. For our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters and for sinners we present this pure and holy offering to you, O God the Father, Almighty Lord. Yes, Lord, it is truly right and just that our minds and hearts be always lifted up to the heights. They are lifted up to you, O Lord of the To you, O God of Abraham, Savior of Isaac, Comforter of Jacob, glorious and holy King forever. It is right and just to thank, worship, and to praise you. your cross and make us worthy of your feast when you appear in glory. Extend the right hand of your mercy over this place and over all its faithful inhabitants. Guard them with your victorious cross from the evil one and his power. Glory be to you, O Lord, our God. In the presence of these divine mysteries we proclaim Kyrie Eleison Kyrie Eleison Glory to you, O praiseworthy and glorious name of the Father and His Son and Holy Spirit you created the world by your grace and its inhabitants in your love and compassion. You have saved all people by your mercy and have given your grace to mortal beings. 
Heavenly beings without number worship your divinity. Beings of light and spirit praise you. Cherubim and seraphim bless and sanctify you. O Lord, by your grace, make us worthy to say with them. Blessed are you, O fruit of the Holy Spirit, gathered from the blessed vine of Mary, pressed in the sterile city of Jerusalem, mixed in the chalice of salvation, and offered for the Holy Church. Those who are pre those who pressed it were scattered and prevented from drinking it. But those who drink it rejoice and sing praises. O most holy one, allow us to approach these holy mysteries and accomplish this Eucharist of the saving passion of your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. May we remember his death, proclaim his resurrection, and complete his entire mystery of salvation with true thanksgiving. For your living and holy name is blessed and worthy of all praise now and forever. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. This moment, my beloved, of the living and Holy Spirit, descends and rests upon this Eucharist to consecrate it. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Through these holy mysteries, may we observe your commandments and be justified before your throne. Make us worthy to spend all the days of our lives without confusion, distress, or trouble. Through your grace and the assistance of your blessed Father, May we please you by doing good. For this reason we implore you and glorify you, O God, our Father, your only Son, Savior of all, and your living Holy Spirit now and forever. We pray and implore you, O Lord God, at this solemn and holy moment, for our fathers who lead us in this life, and for those who govern the Church, Francis, the Pope of Rome, 
the Shouter Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, we pray to you, O Lord. We remember all true and faithful Christians, our brothers and sisters who have asked us, weak though we are, to pray for them. We remember those who are subject to difficulties and who take refuge in you. Visit and deliver them. We pray for this place which God guards and for the peace and spiritual growth of those who live here and that they may live in prosperity. We pray to you, O Lord. We remember all true Christian leaders who have built churches, monasteries, and convents in all parts of the world. We pray for all Christians in their public activities and services, the clergy and all the faithful, that they may lead holy lives. We pray to you, O Lord. We remember the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. With her, we remember the prophets, apostles, evangelists, disciples, martyrs and confessors, John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner of the Savior, Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all the saints. We pray to you, O Lord. We remember those who have died and are among the saints, especially those who have preserved and given us the apostolic faith. We proclaim the four holy ecumenical councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon. We remember all remember our glorious fathers and faithful doctors of the church who dwell with God. St. James, brother of the Lord, the, the, illustri the illustrious apostle, martyr and bishop, Ignatius, Dionysius, Athanasius, Basil, Gregory, Timothy, Eustatius, John, and especially Cyril, the Tower of Truth, the Chosen of God, St. Marin, our Blessed Father, St. James, St. Ephraim, both pillars of our Holy Church, and for all those who kept the true faith and passed it on to us. We pray to you, O Lord. We also remember all the faithful who have died in the true faith and who dwell with you. We implore Christ our Lord, who has called them to pardon their sins and faults, and to lead them and us to his heavenly kingdom. We proclaim three times. Annin monio, annin monio, Lord, open the gates of heaven that the Holy Spirit may be revealed to us from the heights of your holiness. May the Holy Spirit rest upon this chalice to bless and consecrate it by the mystery of your Holy Trinity. May this chalice pardon the debts and remit the sins of all who receive it. May they be worthy of this chalice, reserved for the blessed and everlasting feast. For they will praise your glorious Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever.
O Lord, you are the pleasing salvation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to you, Father, to you. To you be glory forever. O oh Lord God, we are not worthy to stand in your presence, but through the priesthood you have made us worthy to stand before you and present this offering to your name. The cherubim and seraphim who were created to serve you dare not approach you. Isaiah witnessed the seraph lifting a coal with tongs from the altar to his lips. You have shown us your great mercy when you lowered yourself, and in your love you came down to the level of our weakness. Lord Jesus Christ, may your holy cross be our guard against the evil one and his power forever. Amen. O Lord, purify us from every stain of soul and body, that we may be united to you in purity and in holiness. You loved us and you brought us back to you, that we may stand before you and call upon you with the pure and holy prayer you taught your disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now O Lord, we ask you through your grace to place your truth within our hearts, your love within our consciences, and your mercy within our souls. May we share in your kingdom with the guests of your feast, clothed with your body, the white robe of joy. Having conquered Gehenna and having been delivered from death, let us dwell in your light with the saints. We raise glory to the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. O oh Lord, we bow our heads before you, before your forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We worship the glorious Trinity, and we ask through your grace, love, compassion, mercy, and the compassion and forgiveness of our sins. Hear our prayers and be attentive to our petitions. Answer our requests from the abundant treasury of your mercy. Make us worthy to come forward in all purity and holiness to receive the body and blood of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall praise the glorious Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, and be his one in heaven and on earth, to give thee glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, 
so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. Lord our God, to you be glory forever. Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We give you thanks, O living Lamb of God. You came down to earth from heaven. Clothe yourself with the body of our humanity and died for the life and salvation of all people. Prophets and kings yearned to see you, but were unable. Yet you let us, weak sinners, receive you in our human hands and be purified by you. We praise you for your awesome majesty and your goodness toward us. You are the burning fire carried by our hands and the living ember touched by our lips. Purify, O Lord, the mouths, the lips, and the hands of those who held your body. Sanctify the bodies, souls, and spirits of those who have received your blood. Purify their hearts, thoughts, spirits, and all their senses. Mark them with the seal of your cross and place within them your hidden power. O Lord our God, to you be glory now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. May God bless, sanctify, forgive, and protect the faithful who have participated in this divine service of the Holy Mysteries. May God forgive them, their brothers and sisters, and their departed. May God save us from confusion and shame before him on the day of judgment forever and ever. <laughs>